Welcome to Columbia University. My name is Guido Schmidtraub. I'm the Executive Director of the Sustainable Development Solutions Network. In the run-up to the General Assembly, there are many meetings happening back-to-back, uh, -to -back, so some of our speakers are still held up in traffic but are uh, on their way. Um, we, we are here to, so we will, we will get started. Um, Jeff Sachs in particular is running a few minutes late, but he'll join us uh, momentarily. We're here to, um, to present and discuss a number of um, important reports that have um, come out or that are coming out today. The fruits of hard work of international groups of experts under the Sustainable Development Solutions Network. Um, the Sustainable Development Solutions Network, we'll speak more about it, um, was commissioned by UN Secretary General Ban Ki-moon about a year ago to put forward practical solutions for sustainable, de for, for sustainable development and critically to support the discussions that are currently underway to agree on a next generation of development goals. Almost all of you will be familiar with the Millennium Development Goals that have set the benchmark for ending extreme poverty in all its forms and have um, mobilized actors government, civil society, and private sector to an unprecedented extent. And of course, Columbia University has been deeply, very, very deeply engaged in, um, in, the, in the MDGs. They've been such a success that the world has agreed to um, adopt a new set of goals, most likely the Sustainable Development Goals, that will probably cover the period 2016, 2030, covering a much broader spectrum of issues because the world has changed since 2000. Um, and this will happen through an intergovernmental process, so you can all imagine how complicated it is to get governments to agree on, a, on an operational um, agenda. And that's why these reports are so, are so important. So we will, what we will do is we will present these reports. Um, the, the, co -author, the, the lead authors are here. They'll briefly present the reports. Please make a note of your questions. We'll then have a question and answer session um, following the, the presentation of the full range of reports. Um, we want to make this an interactive discussion um, and session, and so we'll, I'm asking all the presenters to keep their, their presentations as short as possible. The first speaker, um, as, as, as per the program, is Shahid Naim, who's the um, director at the Earth Institute Center for Environmental Sustainability, um, one of the world's leading scientists on biodiversity, um, and he is one of the co-authors of, um, of the report on forests, oceans, biodiversity, and ecosystems. Shahid, the floor is yours. Well, thank you all. It's a, it's a pleasure to be leading off, actually, even though I'm thematic group number eight. Um, um, but I um, uh, uh, do feel we have a large domain, and probably it's as good a place as any to start. The um, thematic group's uh, title is Forest, Oceans, Biodiversity, and Ecosystem Services. And um, uh, uh, I wanted to spend more time, I think, explaining what that is, rather than going through a lot of detail over the report, because the report will be available for you to, 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 to look at. The co-chairs are um, uh, myself, Virgilia uh, Viana, who I think is uh, uh, perhaps trying to get through security at the airport, um, Martin uh, Wiesbeck uh, from uh, uh, Germany. So I think we represent a reasonably uh, international and um, quite broad um, uh, 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 co-chair team that is putting this, putting this together, and I'll show you something about our membership later. So um, another name for it might just simply be the living world. I always thought forest, oceans, uh, biodiversity, ecosystem services were very long. And someone said, well, what about grasslands? What about wetlands? What about this sphagnum bog? I mean, everybody's pet ecosystem will be left out. What about urban, urban ecosystems? Um, uh, and so you know, um, to, to start that off, I thought I would begin with um, just a reminder of why we're here. So what you're looking at, obviously, is our planet. And what I love about this is it looks like it's on fire. And actually, from an ecological perspective, it is on fire. But what's being burned is vegetation that was produced millions of years ago as fossil fuels, and we're burning it now. And if we didn't have those fossil fuels, we'd probably be getting those fossil fuels from forests or from other uh, biological uh, sources. You can also see the uh, dynamic weather systems. You can see lightning flashing and all the different um, uh, cloud systems. And this climate um, is really uh, a major interface between the biological world and outer space. Now, what I like about this, this uh, video from the International Space Station is you can see just on the edge, a little hard with the light, um, that there's a boundary. You see that sort of hazy boundary between what is basically a vacuum of space, cold, radioactive, not a great place for anybody or anything. 
And um, uh, what actually shields us from uh, space is something I don't think we think about, um, maybe as scientists we do, because we're often um, focused on problems that are more immediate to hand, right on the ground. And yet, everything that we do, you, uh, myself in this room, every bacterium uh, and every uh, organism affects that. You can really see it when the solar uh, wind hits that shield. It's basically a force field. That's the aurora borealis, which uh, is occurring over the north pole. Um, and it protects us from the solar wind, from gamma rays, from UVB uh, radiation, and many, many other things. And what we forget is that that interface, the atmosphere and the processes in the ocean and the ecosystems that generate it is what makes uh, the outer boundary of the biosphere. Um, so although we're not going to be working <laughs> at, the, at the global level, um, I do think that it is that perspective. There you can see the, you can see the planetary boundary quite clearly um, there. Actually sort of reminds me of the smog of Los Angeles. Um, but um, uh, the, the alternative fates of what we could um, uh, uh, pursue if we wanted to is we could be Venus uh, over, on, over on the uh, uh, the left there, or we could be Mars on the right. And the only reason we are the blue dynamic planet that we are is because we actually have uh, a trillion tons of biomass that is generating all of the biogeochemical processes that make our planet um, what it is. And so our thematic group is focused on this idea that all of these living organisms, and I think this is a laser pointer here, um, all these living organisms are at the foundation of what generates um, the biogeochemical processes that make our atmosphere the shield that it is, that makes our ecosystems uh, productive, producing fuels, food, fiber, and everything else that we need for, uh, to get through our lives. And that's actually done by a trillion tons of biomass, which are made up of animals that we see, and then about half of it is made up of microorganisms that we do not see. And what's neat about them is that they're all connected by this three and a half billion year evolutionary history. The scientific community tends to focus on this part here. But when it comes to sustainable development, sustainability science, when it comes to the interface between social science and natural sciences, this starts to become more relevant, where we see systems that aren't managed so much becoming systems which are managed much more. So here we might have a savanna with wildlife becoming a uh, farm with livestock. And the same is happening in oceans as well, where we see increasing amounts of farming and harvesting and so forth. And even though we don't live in the ocean, it's still become our, our domain. So um, I was in Borneo not too long ago, and I, as an ecologist, I always take my camera. These are pictures I took in a single day of walking around in the, in the forest in, in, in Borneo. And uh, to me, I think this shows the richness of life that's, that's in that forest. Of course, in many cases, if I were to turn around, like where that hawk is, um, that's actually sitting on top of an oil palm plantation. I wouldn't see much diversity at all. Um, so these are the less managed systems, the deserts, the tropical forests, uh, the grasslands, the mountain valleys. And this is what many of them are becoming. They're becoming urban systems, agricultural systems. And whether that's good or bad is not for us to judge. It's just um, uh, uh, the modern reality of how ecosystems are going about doing their business. And our thematic group is uh, recognizing that um, the importance of biodiversity in these systems, as well as the systems that are, last man uh, that are less managed, is very, very important. Not to leave out the oceans, um, <laughs> this is a, a nice picture from the U.S. Uh, uh, postal system for um, uh, uh, diversity in marine systems, but they're changing too as well. Here you can see um, algal beds in, in the ocean uh, being harvested much the way we have taken grasslands and converted them to uh, croplands on terrestrial systems. In fact, over in the, in the lower right there, you might think that's an aerial photo of, of agricultural lands, but it's actually um, uh, seaweed beds. So um, this iconic image, I think it started uh, one of our uh, um, uh, first conferences here when Johann Rockström uh, presents what has become, I think, a, sim uh, a symbolic image for our time, the safe planetary boundaries. Um, I've twisted it from the original publication so that the one that's on the top is the loss of biodiversity. And you can see that compared to nitrogen, which is the next um, biggest um, concern down here, um, and uh, carbon, or uh, climate uh, change, um, biodiversity loss is by the very same community of scientists and thinkers that put this together was recognized to be a boundary that we have 
very badly breached. And it's actually a very difficult boundary to, to, to work with. I think we can find solutions for carbon and nitrogen pollution and some of the other boundaries there much more readily than we can um, dealing with the loss of biological diversity. And um, as a thematic group, we've decided to um, focus on the framework which was pr provided by the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment, in which biological diversity is the source of the way ecosystems function, and then our um, uh, uh, elements of our well-being are derived from the services that we get from those ecosystems. And so we've modified it because we're looking for solutions in which we imagine that uh, over, on, uh, over on the right here that we have ecosystems which are managed in that um, uh, they still provide all of the ecosystem services that you'd, you'd find, um, uh, whether it's managed or not managed, these are not managed, um, but there are a lot more regulatory services that control, say, floods, fires, the spread of disease, and so forth, and lots of cultural values in natural systems, and a lot of supporting things like biogeochemistry that generates that atmosphere that protects us from the vacuum of space, and that we have been managing them with a focus or an eye to provisioning services, food, fuel, fiber, and, and the like. Um, and the consequence is that these other services have shrunk. And so we feel that solutions are to engage the, the social, agricultural, um, and the natural scientists um, uh, to work together to see if we can actually um, get more of a balance of these kinds of services that are all needed um, and still be able to provide the level of provisioning we need for a very large um, uh, human population, one that's uh, growing a bit more, um, uh, and we might reach nine or 10 billion um, in, a, in another uh, few decades. Um, so what we've done is we've come up with areas of action and recommendations, um, and you know, I'll just list them for you briefly. Each of these would take about a page to describe, but you know, to reduce agricultural expansion by improving efficiency, uh, decouple economic development from uh, deforestation. Um, if uh, Virgilio was here, he would, he, would, he would go on about how important this is in many countries to try to develop without it tying yourself to a finite resource that costs um, and, uh, and, and a lot of um, losses of other ecosystem services. Um, develop economic instruments for ecosystem services. Payment for ecosystem services are on the rise, but right now they are not part of many of the ways we economically um, structure our activities. Um, emphasize the particip participatory process. Nothing is going to get done unless people are leading the way. And then two more. Um, expand biodiversity and ecosystem function service uh, research. What we mean by that is we have a lot of understanding about nitrogen cycling, carbon cycling, sulfur cycling, in the, and, and um, eco-hydrology, but less how to connect those to the services we're interested in, especially cultural services. Um, and so we need to, to go much further than we have with the natural sciences. And then develop smart ecosystem governance. And that's a, a complicated idea, but you can imagine that um, what we would like to do is um, to uh, change the way governments have been working um, with non-governmental agencies, um, with its uh, citizens, to consider um, how to regulate ecosystem services and biodiversity as part of its overall activities. And um, the report is, uh, uh, is available. There's some minor editorial revisions we would like to make, so, so it doesn't look too bad here and there. But, um, and we have a summary report as well uh, for it. And I believe that's um, where we're going to end. I did want to thank everyone who's helped us. My uh, computer has looked like this for a long time. <laughs> you can see the spreadsheet for all of the different people we've been considering as participants in the thematic group. And there's the one of many different drafts of the report. And we welcome people um, uh, uh, contributing to this process in the near future. So, um, so, so that's it, and thank you. Great. Um, the next group is, um, uh, I think Joshua Castellino is presenting uh, the report by the Human Rights and, uh, and Gender Equality Group. You see we have a very broad spectrum. Joshua. Thank you, Guido. I'd like to echo the, the, the comments of Chahid there for the pleasure of it is to present to you. Uh, you're not going to get fancy graphs and, and dynamic looking slides from me, I'm afraid. It's just going to be straight talk. Um, essentially, our thematic group, which I'm privileged to co-chair with Bineta Diop um, from Femme Africa Solidarity, was really brought together to look at the extent to which 
human rights and people could be put at the heart of this process of sustainable development. And with that in mind, what we, had, what we did do is consult a wide variety of people across 13 time zones the last time I checked and tried to get really some kind of indication of the kinds of challenges that people were facing at ground level in terms of trying to understand how people could be put at the center of these particular processes. So what we, what we have essentially as a starting point was the fact that the MDGs did do and did focus a lot on women, but didn't really focus on minorities or other groups and certainly didn't speak specifically about vulnerability as a context in, in the human, human rights uh, field. And that, that for us is a central problem. We tackled the issue. Human rights has become accepted rhetoric now and is part of legal systems across the world, including in Syria as we speak. But largely when you look at the practice of human rights, there is a gap that's forming between those who have and those that don't. And Paul Collier, for instance, talked about this as being perhaps the bottom billion. And our, really, our central focus was to look for ways in which we could make social inclusion, gender equality, and human rights, and bring it to the heart of the processes we are looking forward to. Because essentially, when we talk about planetary boundaries and we talk about the kinds of things that Shahid focused on and that many of the other groups focus on, whatever the problem that might lie within the context of the science of this, when you have it play out in a world of finite resources, women, minorities, others in vulnerable positions are going to fall further behind, and that's going to lead to greater inequality. The human rights agenda itself has made major inroads in trying to guarantee the inherent dignity and worth of every individual, but it has problems. It hasn't really tackled the issue of socioeconomic rights adequately. So we still have this vision of human rights laws being practiced by lone, articulate advocates fighting against states, hoping to get some kind of scrap to take back to their clients. And we need to change that mentality if we're going to get a more equal world and certainly a more sustainable world. So our approach was to look at a variety of different aspects across countries, and the report co covers about 40 countries. We look for administrative practices, we look for solutions that are being attempted by various groups on the ground to try and get to that notion of really being able to protect equality and non-discrimination as fundamental. So the work of our thematic group in many ways cuts across what exists in, in terms of the other goals, because you have to look at the impact of the other goals on this particular group. In many ways, you could argue that the, the focus of our particular group, the individuals within that group, and the communities within that group, are really something of a litmus test as to how effective uh, uh, any solutions can be going forward. Because whether you look at environmental degradation, whether you look at issues of carbon, uh, whether you look at issues of carbon uh, capture, all of those kinds of issues are likely to hurt those in vulnerable positions to a much greater extent than it will hurt those in more privileged positions. So the rhetoric of human rights really, in many ways, has to be unpacked to look at the impact that it has on these kinds of groups. And the solutions that exist do exist in many different societies because societies are actively working to try and create better systems to protect all. Why? Because it's part of a political imperative. It's part of the process of social inclusion. So what we're trying to do in our particular thematic group is to capture that good practice that exists, whether it's good practice with regards to microfinance, whether it's good practice with regards to land rights regimes, whether it's good practice with regards to inheritance regimes. All of these are key elements that essentially keep the, the human community, if you like, divided and in a hierarchical position. And we argue that unless we get this notion of social inclusion right at the heart of any future planning process, we are simply going to perpetrate existing inequalities into the future. And then no matter what we do or in terms of the other elements that exist, if we have a world that's unequal, we will have a group of people from among us who will fall further and further behind. And that is not something we believe that can be afforded in the wider context of trying to gain sustainable development. So the report itself consists of about 30 pages. There's 12 specific aspects or solutions that we focus on. Um, I won't really have a chance to take you through it, so I'll give you a flavor of some of the aspects we've looked at. We've looked at, for instance, enabling access and control over resources. We look a little bit at providing access to decent work and livelihoods, uh, ensuring access to public services. Uh, we look in more detail at land rights regime. We look at access to information. 
facilitating access to justice. And it's really a much broader agenda than you would typically find if you looked at this from a purely human rights lens. Because the purely human rights lens has tended to focus on legislative measures and on ways to use the law to gain recompense for victims. What, what we are ad advocating is a far more broad social policy, administrative law aspect and drive that will put people who are vulnerable at the center of what we do. The idea of, of creating a legal regime that can then be accessed by the victims is flawed because actually the victims in many cases don't have access to the regime you create. And that is a fundamental problem. So trying to tackle this problem purely through law and hoping that the courts will be able to resolve inequality is never really given us as much traction as we could get if we focused and mainstreamed all of these elements on social inclusion and gender and human rights into our policies across the world. And again, this, this message also is important to bear in mind because we're looking at examples from across the world. Too often, we've essentially picked and focused on particular Western models which don't fit in other countries. So you have 70% odd countries in the world who have come out of colonization who very, whose legal systems very much bear resemblance to the colonial, uh, colonial countries that existed there before. Well, those legal systems don't translate very well to the ground realities that exist. So we're looking to learn from the South. We're looking to find specific elements that have worked in countries to refine them, work on them, and see if they could be reproduced elsewhere. And I think for us, for, for the members of this thematic group, this really is at the heart of putting people right at the, uh, right at the center of the agenda on sustainable development. Thank you. Thank you very much, Joshua. We are going to next move to, to health. Um, the health thematic group is co-coordinated by Srinath Reddy, who is the president of the Public Health Foundation in India and one of the, one of the global authorities on public health. Srinath. Good afternoon. The fact that health is absolutely critical for development and particularly germane to sustainable development is undisputed. Even when the Millennium Development Goals were framed in year 2000, this reality was recognized with at least three of the Millennium Development Goals explicitly dealing with health and others structured around the social determinants of health. However, as we now look at the post-2015 Sustainable Development Goals, how do we position health in the broader context of sustainable development building on the successes of the Millennium Development Goals, but correcting some of the deficiencies of those goals and bridging the gaps that have appeared. That was the challenge that was posed to the thematic group on health. I've had two co-chairs and several experts in the group, and the other two co-chairs have been Irene Agupong from Ghana and Gordon Liu from China and the contribution of many other members of the thematic group are gratefully acknowledged. Indeed, the Millennium Development Goals have achieved some successes, particularly in terms of child mortality and maternal mortality. However, there continue to remain gaps between countries, and particularly within countries between different social groups. The aggregate na national indicators of child or maternal mortality have not actually clearly indicated that there are health inequities which are often masked. The lower economic groups do not often benefit from some of these interventions as much as the higher economic groups. So how does one also build in an equity lens into it? Secondly, while it was useful to focus on certain discrete age groups and particular diseases, especially the infectious diseases, that both segmented human life into some select age groups and fragmented the health system into vertical programs, which has had a huge opportunity cost. So how does one actually overcome that? For example, the whole area of non-communicable diseases was not included, despite the high burden of cardiovascular disease, diabetes, cancers, nor was mental health included nor was reproductive health, access to reproductive health services clearly indicated. And even in the age groups, a very vital area of development, adolescent health, was excluded. And clearly we now recognize that there is a continuum of health from conception to elderly age group, and therefore one has to take a life course approach to health. 
Otherwise, we end up, as the MDGs did, with another kind of MDGs, the missing development goals. And we need to ensure that this does not happen in this iteration. And that is why we adopted a life course approach in which a health system which is adequately resourced and well-functioning forms the foundation for delivery of a variety of services and engages constructively with other sectors to ensure that policies in those sectors are both sensitive and aligned to public health concerns. And therefore, the stress on life course approach, universal health coverage, and pro-health policies in all sectors. That is the core of our recommendation. So the goal that's being proposed, the overarching goal, is achieve health and well-being at all ages. This implies that all countries achieve universal health coverage at every stage of life, with particular emphasis on primary health services, including mental and reproductive health, to ensure that all people receive quality health services without suffering financial hardship. Countries also implement policies to create enabling social conditions that promote the health of populations and help individuals make healthy and sustainable decisions related to their daily living. Now, I understand that the word universal health coverage means differently in different populations. And in the United States, there is a debate between access and coverage. But we have defined, actually, coverage to be much more comprehensive than mere geographical access or access without affordability. We have defined universal health coverage to include three vital dimensions. Firstly, what proportion of population is covered? Secondly, what are the range of services provided? And third, how much of the financial cost is absorbed without actually having to have out-of-pocket spending? and therefore financial healthcare related impoverishment. Now we recognize that all of this is not going to be 100% achieved on day one in any country, but progressively moving towards this in all, in all the three dimensions is going to be critical. That is why we have emphasized primary health services. We have emphasized a high level of public financing supported by other means of financing, whether it is employer provided insurance or private insurance, all of which reduces the amount of personal burden for an individual or a family and reduces out-of-pocket expenditure and therefore healthcare-related impoverishment. We do stress quality of health services substantially and therefore universal health coverage is much more embraceable in terms of its concept as per our definition. We recommend that countries, uh, basically in terms of this, we recommend that uh, we have also set three targets uh, associated with this. The three targets are, ensure, first, first one, ensure universal coverage of quality health care, including the prevention and treatment of communicable and non-communicable diseases, sexual and reproductive health, family planning, routine immunization, and mental health, according the highest priority to primary health care. Because it is in primary health care that much of promotive, preventive, palliative, curative services can be and rehabilitative services can be provided, giving the greatest benefit to all, but particularly giving the greatest benefit to the poor. It is in primary health care that you can actually ensure that much of disease can be prevented or prevented from progressing to complications where expensive secondary and tertiary care is going to be required. But we do recognize that secondary care is also required in many cases, for example, em emergency obstetric care. So we have actually built in a range of services, but keep the emphasis on primary services. Uh, we, and linked to this is, the, we recommend that countries adopt suitably updated MDG indicators for HIV AIDS, TB and malaria, as well as for neglected tropical diseases. Again, this was missing in the previous in, uh, MDGs. The second target is to end preventable deaths by reducing child mortality to 20 or fewer deaths per 1,000 births, maternal mortality to 40 or fewer deaths uh, per 100,000 live births, and mortality under 70 years of age from non-communicable diseases by at least 30% compared to the level in 2015. Uh, we recognize that some countries have actually achieved these goals have fallen below in terms of infant and maternal mortality. Therefore, they're urged to even drop lower. 
Countries that have achieved the mortality target should set more ambitious aggregate targets that are commensurate with their development and ensure that minimum quantitative targets are achieved for every subpopulation. Even if you've fallen below 20 for infant mortality rate, has the poorest 20% also reached that level? So for the equity lens comes in there, so they're urged to do more, not to be complacent about their achievements so far. The second target is, uh, uh, the third target is to implement policies to promote and monitor healthy diets, physical activity, and subjective well-being, reduce unhealthy behavior such as tobacco use by 30%, and harmful use of alcohol by 20%. Uh, we believe that health is integral to sustainable development, not only because of its intrinsic value, but because there are core benefits for a number of other thematic groups and related sectors. You cannot separate health and nutrition from agriculture and food systems. And poverty reduction is inconceivable and unachievable without investing in health because health is both a cause and consequence of poverty. Gender is critically related to health and so on. Therefore, we have very clear cut linkage, even in terms of energy security, there's a clear linkage to the kind of wood fuels that are burnt, which result in huge amount of indoor air pollution and cause respiratory disease, as well as childhood infections and contribute to child mortality. Therefore, there is a huge web of connectivity, and therefore health remains an integral part of sustainable development. But unless we emphasize these cardinal elements of life course approach, universal health coverage, and pro-health policies in all sectors, we are not going to advance either health or sustainable development. And as Tony Morrison said in the Song of Solomon, if we don't create the future, the present extends itself. In terms of health inequities, the present, ladies and gentlemen, is unacceptable. Thank you. The next presentation will be by um, the two co-chairs of our urban group. Um, explaining why the world needs an urban goal. And this, is, um, this is an issue that's very dear to our hearts and actually goes to the core of how the world should think about its priorities. So please, um, Aroma Rebi and, uh, and Cynthia Rosenzweig. Um, Cynthia is a senior research scientist here at the NASA Chess Center, and Aroma is the director, the head of the Indian Institute for Human Settlements in Bangalore. Please, the floor is yours. Good afternoon. I'm going to present the slides on, the, on why the world needs an urban SDG, and then my, my colleague, Aramar Revi, will make commentary from uh, his point of view. We are co-chairs of thematic group nine of the SDSN. One half the world's population of seven billion live in cities. This is projected to grow to two thirds by 20, sometime between 2010 and 2050. By 2030, there will be one billion more urban residents. At the same time, as we think about the challenges of sustainable development, we know that cities are responsible for the bulk of production and consumption worldwide. And they are the primary engines of economic growth and development. These two facets are really the fundamental argument for an urban sustainable development goal. The city groups and urban, uh, major urban groups around the world are joining together to promote the inclusion of an urban SDG, UN Habitat, UCLG, which is the global network of cities, local and regional governments. Cities Alliance, which is the group that is working to upgrade slums in developing country cities around the world. And ICLE, Local Governments for Sustainability, who are one of, one of, it's one of the main NGOs working on bringing climate change mitigation and adaptation to help the cities fulfill their roles as first responders to climate change. So why does the world need an urban SDG? We're going to present six reasons. First, 
to educate and focus attention on urgent urban challenges and future opportunities. The SDGs play an important role of focusing attention of the whole world on ways that are needed to go forward. An urban SDG will educate leaders of cities as well as leaders of nations who work on financing what happens in cities and the public on the challenges and opportunities because while I mentioned the opportunities in terms of the economic growth leadership of cities, at the same time, we know that there are tremendous challenges of urban poverty. These, this urban SDG will be an education tool and an attention focusing tool on this urgent, absolutely essential area for sustainable development. The next reason is to mobilize and empower all urban actors around practical problem solving. At the same time, while we have, of course, the global urbanization issues and national, we also know that a lot of the decisions happen right in cities themselves. The challenges that each city faces are complex and context specific. Therefore, the, an urban SGG will help to mobilize local authorities, mayors, community organizations, universities, businesses, and the national authorities to all work together around practical problem solving for sustainable development. The third reason is to address the specific challenges of urban poverty and access to infrastructure. Now, we know that a great proportion of, the urban, of, of, of poor people live in urban areas. It's not just the whole world is living more in cities, but the poor live in cities too. And urban poverty differs from rural poverty. We need to focus and sharpen attention on urban poverty and the arrangements that are needed to fund, implement, and track progress for the urban poor. The fourth motivation is to promote integrated and innovative infrastructure design and service delivery. How are we going to achieve sustainable cities? The challenge is just as city systems are interconnected and interdependent, we need innovative solutions that must be applied through integrated infrastructure planning at the city level. For the billions of dollars of investment that are going to be made in the coming decade and decades, how will we actually achieve sustainable development? Clearly, creating these innovative infrastructure design of transportation systems, energy systems in cities, all the water systems, every single part needs to be integrated and innovative for sustainable development in cities. Fifth, cities occur in space and we have to promote land use planning. And here we bring in the peri-urban areas and the relationship between urban and rural areas and the interactions. In order for, for sustainable to, uh, development to occur, we have to work at a planning level and think about efficiently using our space and the spatial concentration of those billion more people. Well-planned, mixed-use, and compact cities generally offer higher levels of well-being at lower levels of research use and greenhouse gas emissions. Finally, the world needs an urban SDG to ensure resilience to climate change and disaster risk reduction. Cities are indeed emerging as first responders to climate change on both mitigation and adaptation. 
integrating resilience planning and disaster risk reduction into city management and infrastructure design requires site-specific and city-level targets. And the cities are already beginning to set targets and timetables for their emissions. They are leading the way, even helping the nation states to, to, to um, understand those responsibilities. So here's our uh, information for the SDSN, but I want to turn now to our RMR for some, for, for, to finish our presentation. Do we have time or not? Okay, Jeff is next. And then I hope that RMR can um, share his perspectives. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I wanted to sneak, how are you? Wanted to uh, sneak in uh, because I have to step out for uh, uh, a moment uh, imminently. I want to thank all of the thematic groups for the wonderful leadership and to say a few words about how this activity fits into both the global diplomacy and the ground level problem solving. I know that Guido has started and you get a good feel for this from these wonderful presentations. We're in the middle of first the process of setting the new post-2015 sustainable development goals. Next week on September 25th, the uh, heads of state attending the General Assembly will uh, agree on a timetable to set the post-2015 goals. The theme groups are going to play an important role this coming year in the substantive input to the negotiations that will take place this year. We have a one meeting scheduled a full day on science for sustainable development in December with the intergovernmental process, but there will inevitably be tremendous contacts between the thematic groups and the very specific negotiations that are now intensifying. So one part of the role of the SDSN through its thematic group leadership is to actually help bring about a coherent, sensible set of sustainable development goals by 2015. And the timeline that will be agreed next week will call for an initial set of goals to be established by the end of next year and a high level summit in 2015 in which world leaders will confirm this agenda. At least that's the uh, ostensible timetable. And it's interesting, everybody's talking about sustainable development now, which is a great thing, uh, and uh, meaning an integrated vision of economic, social, and environmental uh, development, which is, I think, uh, a more intensive and constructive discussion than we've seen before. Uh, the main point of all of this is that governments have realized it's not going to be good enough to leave these issues to a few treaties. Uh, if the publics are not actively engaged, if expert communities are not actively engaged, if cities are not actively solving problems, if we're not getting real decision making on the local level, we're not going to get transformation at anything like the pace that the planet needs. The second role of the theme groups, which we haven't really started yet, is to be an interface with a widening global network which will constitute the Sustainable Development uh, Solutions Network in the future. There will be about 100 universities formally signed up to the SDSN by the end of this year, and I would predict 1,000 by 2015 when the goals come into fruition. All over the world, heads of state, university chancellors, vice chancellors, rectors are wanting to become involved in what will be the transformative policy issue of our time. And the SDSN is organized to play a role over the period of the life of the new set of goals, not only up to 2015, but from 2016 to 2030, to facilitate local problem solving. We don't know how exactly this should be done and how it will work, but the theme groups should be 
points of contact to make sure that in any part of the world there's a way for local experts to gain access to best information, best knowledge, uh, good case studies, uh, special expertise on these issues. These issues are complicated. They are not simple. This is not just a matter of political will or morality or focus. These are hard issues to turn the world in a different kind of growth paradigm that is environmentally sound as well as socially and economically sound. And we have in the theme groups, you know in the leadership and across the groups themselves, hundreds in fact of experts that are coming together in all of the different areas and they need to be points of contact for a world community. So how that's going to work out is partly what we're going to discuss in the next couple of days when we have the uh, Leadership Council meeting of Sustainable Development Solutions Network of how to make sure that the theme groups not only service these intensive intergovernmental processes, not only produce wonderful reports for everybody to read, but also become at the core of a worldwide network of discussion, problem solving, case management, uh, exchange of ideas, public debates on controversial issues, and the like. One of the things that we'll be building is a large repository of online materials, courses, and special lectures, studies, materials that go along with each of these thematic groups. So all of this is to say that what you're watching is the opening of a 17-year act, like the locusts, I suppose. Uh, they reappear every 17 years. Uh, so you're watching the, uh, the, the, the initial uh, 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 coming to life of what aims to be and what the Secretary General hopes will be, not the locusts, but, uh, uh, but uh, in fact, a new way of global problem solving, uh, which is quite different from what we've had up until now. What we've had up until now for 41 years ago in Stockholm, we had a warning. 21 years ago, we had three treaties. Last year, we had a sense of, oh my God, uh, we're not making it. And what is underway right now is an attempt to find a new direction of problem solving that mobilizes the world public, governments, and is underpinned by world-class expertise. So you're watching the world-class expertise, and we're going to be inventing together as we go along in the next couple of years new ways to make sure that this expertise supports experts all over the world, because if we're going to make it, we're going to need problem solving in every city in the world, we're going to need problem solving certainly in every national government. We're going to need problem solving across regions. And it's going to be a different kind of discussion and debate. We hope the politicians will join in, but they're not going to be at the center of it because real people and real lives are too much at stake to wait for our politicians. Uh, so we're trying to help accelerate the movement forward of real solutions. And I want to thank all of the theme groups for putting us on such a powerful start for this, but also alerting everybody that we have a lot of brainstorming to do to figure out how to be as effective and creative and dynamic as possible to really infuse the public discussion all over the world with the kind of information that's needed. And I will say to our students here, this is your world. So uh, you're going to be doing this kind of problem solving and leadership in new ways. And we want your ideas, thoughts, engagement now, and especially energies for how to harness this kind of information and systems thinking into broader purpose. So thank you very much, everybody. I apologize uh, to sneak in the middle of the urban presentation, but uh, we're going to hear from Aromar next uh, and, uh, and then uh, continuing on with, the, 
wonderful presentations. Thanks. I'll just make some brief comments, picking up from where Cynthia and Jeff left off. Um, cities are important for a very simple reason, and that is if we have to effect this dramatic transformation that Jeff talked about, a systemic transformation, the place where it is most effectively done in this century, uh, a century which is essentially going to be an urban century, is in cities. The challenge, of course, is that we do not know how to do this. Cities have been around for 5,000 years, and in many cases, as we have crashed our cities, we have crashed our civilizations. I think the fundamental challenge to a planetary urban civilization, which cuts across both global and national boundaries, <coughs> is to be able to get this right. Uh, the governance frame has to change, and of course, for us, the most critical question is if we are to end urban poverty, and in fact, if we have to end extreme poverty in both urban and rural areas, cities have to be the primary drivers of that process. It's, it's fairly simple. The structure of both the global economy and many national economies of the world have changed dramatically. Um, Two-thirds or more of national product and global product come from cities. Of course, half our population comes from cities. And of course, on the other end, on the environmental end, both on the greenhouse gas side and on and dealing with global environmental challenges, the key driver is cities. So for us to be able to transform and bring all these actions together, it is necessary to be able to implement them at city level. And this, as I said, is not easy because we have historically, in governments, focused on looking at problems sectorally. Sectoral approaches are very effective, and like we've just heard just now, to be able to implement a universal health coverage goal is only possible if you look at it sectorally. The challenge, of course, is the synergies are not possible to achieve unless you bring all of these processes together, unless you're, enabled, or you're able to be able to generate the growth, the employment, the opportunities for livelihood, and hence enable people to move out of poverty. Similarly, if you're not able to deal with the growth and development of cities, it, it, it's rather challenging and difficult to deal with the question of rural development and, and, and poverty. So cities provide us a very interesting, integrative way to examine and engage with these challenges. And we hope uh, over the next you know, 15 and, or, or 20 years, and certainly the next two years or so, as the STSN process moves forward, we're able to test this, starting with five or six cities in different parts of the world, and examine whether we can inform a global framework through local action. And this, I think, is one of the most fundamental challenges that we will be faced, because working at the level of the nation state is an established practice. Working through a system of multi-level governance that functions at the level of the city, the region, the country, and, and, and eventually globally is something that we have to understand and work with. And cities, I think, are going to provide us this tremendous opportunity to make that change. Thank you. Thank you, Aramar. You're, you're, having, you're having a tour de force through all the major challenges of sustainable development. So we're next moving to the issues of um, extractive resources. We have um, two co-chairs to this thematic group, Paul Collier, who will introduce the report. Paul is, is of course, director at the Center for the Study of African Economies at Oxford University. And Antonio Pedro, who is the director of the Economic Commission for Africa, they have agreed to split their role. So Paul will present the report and uh, and Pedro will take all the questions afterwards. Um, Paul, please. <laughs> I'll land you in it, Pedro, yeah. Um, thank you very much. Um, the um, natural resource extraction is kind of the ultimate in unsustainable development strategies. Um, and a sort of 17-year horizon is about the right horizon uh, to realize that. The, it, this is particularly important for the poorest countries on earth because over the last decade, many of these poor countries during the commodity booms have made big resource discoveries. And often those resource discoveries are gonna last a couple of decades, maybe one generation. And then that's it. And so it's a, 
one hand a huge opportunity, at last the poorest countries on earth have got their own money, their own assets. So it's their opportunity to transform themselves with their own resources. Um, so, it's, so it's a marvelous opportunity. It's a one-shot game. You, you've got your resources for one generation, and that's it. So this generation of adults in these societies carries huge opportunity and hence a huge responsibility. It's made worse by the fact that if we look back historically, this has happened before, and for many countries, it was a, mis it was a missed opportunity. Not for all. It's perfectly possible to use natural resources as a dynamo to development. Botswana, a country I work with, 40 years ago, about the poorest society on earth. And then for decades, it was the fastest growing country, not just in Africa, but in the world. And it's now an upper middle, up middle income country. And then you look at Sierra Leone, the same damn resource, diamonds, bottom of the human development index. Same resource. Took one country up like a rocket, one country down like a stone. So the challenge is to, for all of us, is to do what we can to try and help these societies harness this opportunity rather than repeat history. How can that be done? It's their struggle, but we can help. And what is their struggle? Their struggle in economic terms is to march through a long decision chain, um, which starts with the, simple, you know, the, the basic business of discover your natural assets. And that's complicated in economic terms. It's part of the economics of information. And we know that in the economics of information, um, markets don't work very well, right? because information is a public good. So one of the uh, sort of principles we're trying to promote is get public geological information so that you actually know what you've got. Once you've discovered natural assets, you've got to tax them. Because you've got to use international companies to get them out of the ground. They've got the skills and the finance. But they are, in effect, uh, custodians of the natural assets of poor societies. And in that sense, they're a bit like banks. They're custodians of other people's assets. Now, we've kind of learned the hard way that it's a good idea to regulate people who are the custodians of other people's assets. Um, we do that after a fashion with banks. Actually, the regulation of banks is 50 years ahead of the regulation of the process of natural resource extraction. It's just starting to be built, the international system of regulation. But we also need national systems of regulation. So you discover your assets, you tax them, um, you look after the local, natural resources are always found somewhere in particular. It's a, it's, a, it's a localized phenomenon. And that carries both the challenge of environmental degradation, of avoiding it, of compensating for it, and the challenge of where does ownership lie? Natural assets don't have natural owners. They're just there. And so if you're not careful, there's a struggle between the rights of the local and the rights of the national. So you discover, you tax, you deal appropriately with the local. And then, having got your revenues, you come to the sustainability part. And the sustainability part means you've got to save a lot of this money. A lot of those revenues need to go into assets rather than just into current consumption. What assets? Well, not Norway's strategy. Norway parks its money abroad. And that's sensible for Norway because it's the richest society on earth. It's got more invested capital per member of the labor force than any other society. So it makes sense for Norway to accumulate capital in Brazil or China. It makes no sense for Sierra Leone or South Sudan. They're desperately short of capital within their societies. But one reason they're desperately short is they're not built the capacity to do investment well. 
And so the final shape, part of the economic decision chain is building that capacity for good domestic investment processes. So that's the economic decision chain. But then what's the politics that brings that about instead of producing plunder, which was the outcome last time round? And I've come to think of the, um, the politics that supports that economic decision chain as a tripod of rules and institutions and a critical mass of citizen understanding. Uh, the rules are kind of clear enough. I've already discussed some of them. You need a regulatory environment for, for natural resource extraction. Um, the institutions are basically uh, teams of skilled people mandated to implement the rules. But rules and institutions are just words on paper unless they're supported by a critical mass of citizens. And as Jeff said, that's why it's important to take this beyond government to people. Um, people have two roles in resource-rich countries, both absolutely vital. One is they've got to, as it were, be sufficiently up to speed that they don't connive in plunder, that they understand that when a society when the headlines are we've struck oil, that doesn't mean you don't have to work anymore. Right? Um, first president of Botswana got this marvelously right. Um, and he, he, he introduced a narrative that said we're poor and therefore we're going to have to carry a heavy load. In other words, we're going to have to be patient and work hard and build our society. He also carefully went round all the clan chiefs before they discovered diamonds, to say, we're looking for something. And his narrative there was, we've got nothing. We're a dirt poor society. Let's at least agree that whatever we do find will benefit everybody. Okay. So first president of Botswana built the narratives which gave citizens support for good stewardship and um, for, for shared ownership, for equity. But citizens have another role, um, because governments are not saints. Um, governments can be tempted into plunder. And so the other role of, of citizens, of an informed citizenry, is scrutiny, is holding government to account. And the temptations for plunder in resource-rich countries are overwhelming. That's why it happened so often last time. And so building that critical mass of citizen understanding is fundamental to getting that economic decision chain in place. So that's how you turn from a, an intrinsically unsustainable process, pulling a finite set of resources out of the ground, which over the next generation will happen, to truly sustainable development. In this context, sustainability is fundamentally an economic phenomenon. It's about depleting one set of assets, natural assets, and accumulating other sets of natural assets. And just let me pass the word that one of the most important assets to accumulate is an effective city. Thank you very much, everybody. <laughs>
First, I'd like to thank my co-chair who could not make it uh, to this meeting, uh, unfortunately, Madhav Chavan, who is the uh, founder of the education NGO Pratan in India, um, but also wanted to thank Chandrika Bahadur, who is here uh, somewhere in the audience, who is our uh, a wonderful collaborator at the Secretariat, um, and it's been wonderful to work with both of them on this uh, report. Um, so I'm going to start with some premises and actually take you in, in some uh, detail, but very briefly, through our proposed um, goal, target, and indicators. Um, so uh, it's wonderful to hear these groups together because I think we understand the commonality uh, uh, among the groups and where um, some common themes emerge. One, of course, is the notion of human resources. Um, and uh, our belief and what drives this group's work is that uh, no society will engage in sustainable development without multiple generations being involved in that process of improvement. Um, what is happening in the world right now is that a larger proportion and far larger numbers of the world's population will be young, 0 to 25 in 2030 in the developing countries, but a much larger proportion will also be um, between 40 and 70 in the developed countries. So this uh, may uh, look uh, familiar to you in terms of uh, the pattern in developed countries, uh, the projection for t uh, 2030, which is that the majority uh, will be between 40 and 70 years old. In developing countries, um, as of 2015, um, uh, we see a, a very different pattern, um, and that pattern will become accentuated uh, with the vast majority of uh, the world's uh, population uh, in developing countries, meaning really the majority of the world's population being zero to 25. And so the investment in this, uh, these billions uh, of the world's uh, population will be critical. And uh, as Guido foreshadowed, um, our uh, sense is that the nature of learning is changing. Uh, we do need to move beyond uh, the MDG's focus on inputs and access to really think about what are the dimensions of learning that will be important, uh, not just for the next 15 years, uh, but for the upcoming decades? Certainly, we still have major challenges in the areas of reading and math skills, but beyond basic literacy and numeracy, we need to think about digital, science, financial literacy, innovation, creativity, teamwork, and collaboration, and what are called, uh, economists call non-cognitive skills, what psychologists like me call social and emotional skills, self-control, persistence, attention. The sum total of these skills uh, result in the ability to come up with sustainable solutions, in particular local, city, rural, and national contexts. And so we are shifting um, uh, the attention and the goals, targets, and indicators from solely inputs to add an emphasis on learning. This is not about moving away from inputs, but to add an emphasis on learning. And to think about learning as occurring across generations, across the lifespan, and across settings. Uh, and we must get beyond the traditional uh, four walls um, uh, and classroom kinds of environments to think about learning in a much greater variety of settings, in families, communities, networks, um, media, and the critical role that technology will be able to play in this. Um, so our focus here is on multi-generational learning and lifelong learning. Um, very uh, quickly, I think a lot of this is fairly well known. Uh, there have been enormous increases in primary school access. Um, the dark red is uh, between 95 and 100 um, uh, percent, and you see um, some, some big increases there between 1990 and 2010. Um, dark orange here is 90 to 95, orange is 75 to 90. Um, but we all know uh, from many country contexts that the increase in access has not gone along with an increase in learning. So in the cases where folks have gone in to actually measure what children are learning and how they're achieving, whether on basic skills or this wider set of skills, uh, we are um, nowhere near keeping up with the progress in access. Um, and one of those indicators is that completion is still uh, quite a ways behind. So if you look at these blue colors, darkest blue is 80 to 100 percent, dark blue, the next uh, uh, darkest shade is 60 to 80 percent, medium blue is 40 to 60 percent. We are far from uh, achieving primary school completion, and that's why uh, secondary school entry is, uh, is still far behind. Um, and I think you're all also familiar with the disparities by income, by rural urban origin, by gender, um, certainly other indicators such as linguistic background, indigenous status in much of the world, uh, and, uh, and uh, disability status. Um, 
And so uh, here with secondary school access, we see the stark difference between the global north and the global south. Um, these are the same colors uh, uh, as for um, primary school enrollment. Um, and uh, so you see uh, the bulk of the, the red or even close to the red being really in the uh, developed countries. And in pre-primary education, we see um, very, very low levels. Uh, this is that same set of color schemes. Um, and in low-income uh, countries in particular, uh, the growth has been uh, barely uh, 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 going from 11% in 1990 to 15% coverage for uh, pre-primary education. So what are uh, some of the challenges? I'm not going to take you through this because it's hard to read anyway, but um, I've reduced some of this to bullets. Um, what I'm going to talk a little bit about from this uh, 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 graph, which is a summary of where we think uh, uh, the, the sector of education needs to go to contribute to sustainable development, is that we need innovation in delivery channels. If we view learning as occurring not just in schools, but in families, in communities, in workplaces, uh, then we do think that the notion and the modalities of delivery of education need to be reconsidered. So part of this report is meant to be very forward thinking about those, um, to set some goals that might be a little bit harder to quantify um, because they are not in the traditional uh, percentages of kind of access to primary or secondary or tertiary education. Um, so what are the shifts away from business as usual? And we have a section on the costs of business as usual. We do think um, completing the promise of the MDGs for universal primary and secondary education is going to be key, but we really want to emphasize the broadening of the concept of learning to include uh, social and emotional 21st century skills, uh, the ones I uh, mentioned a few slides ago. Um, to learn from the lessons of primary expansion, to combine the objectives of learning and access for secondary schooling, um, and really, again, try to uh, uh, integrate this notion of inputs with uh, the outputs of learning. Um, beyond survival, uh, we think, and this would be a major new um, uh, uh, target in the sense that there was no target in the MDGs around early childhood development. Um, beyond survival, beyond, beyond infant mortality, that children zero to eight have a right to thrive and learn uh, beyond child survival. Um, and that the transition to adulthood on the other side of the traditional education sector is a period for learning that can be matched both with the rapidly shifting job demands in many economies, but also solving sustainable development challenges. Um, and finally, to realize adults, adult learning's powerful impacts on community participation, thinking about parents as, um, as a particularly important target population for adult uh, and non-formal learning and education opportunities. So our goal is to ensure effective learning for all children and youth for life and livelihood um, from the SDSM report in June. Uh, what we've done with the targets is to refine them and then uh, add indicators. Um, so we have added a comprehensive early childhood development indicator, all children under the age of five reaching their developmental potential through access to quality early childhood development programs and policies. And this broadening of the notion of learning is there right from birth. Um, so we think about physical, cognitive, social, and emotional domains of learning and development. Um, there is an urgency to adding early childhood development. One of the ways that the research literature has expanded over the last 20 years um, is impressive new benefit cost data on how, just how good an investment um, investing in children before they enter school is. And um, I can refer you all to a wonderful uh, column by um, James Heckman in uh, the New York Times last Sunday uh, that really made this uh, argument. And this is driven by um, estimates, for example, that raising preschool pre-primary enrollment to 50% in every country would produce benefits of over $33 billion in U.S. dollars uh, with a benefit cost ratio of 8 to 18, depending on the discount rate. Um, our indicators, which I'm not going to read through for early childhood development, but just to indicate that uh, here, um, early childhood development could have gone in, in a few of the thematic uh, groups, certainly in health. Our first four indicators are really about health. Um, because there are indicators such as stunting, which if they are not um, uh, dealt with before the age of two, are essentially irreversible conditions in children's growth. Um, and that's because of the rapidity of the growth of brain architecture and neuronal development uh, in the first years of life. Um, and uh, what you'll see here, though, is an emphasis on what are the feasible, scalable, and cost-effective interventions that have been proven in the early childhood field um, in low- and middle-income countries, but also high-income countries, as Guido mentioned. 
Um, in target 3B, uh, second of three, uh, focus on quality learning and completion um, integrated, and so our language um, deviates a bit from the MD MDG or even education for all kinds of language. Um, that all girls and boys receive quality primary and secondary education with a focus on learning outcomes. Uh, and I'm reducing the dropout rate uh, to zero. So we see some of the familiar kinds of completion rates, but also mastery of um, basic skills as well as an extended set of uh, learning standards, um, including financial and technical literacy by age 14, um, an age um, at which uh, there can be a much more flexible education systems that interact with the surrounding communities and economies in ways that are not simply about one pathway through education. A focus on adult literacy rates for women and men and a uh, indicator on government spending on education as a proportion of total GDP. And finally, um, youth unemployment rate being below 10% um, as somewhat of a marker for some of these other indicators that are about tertiary enrollment, the proportion of adolescents with access to school to work programs, and the proportion of adults participating in continuing education programs. A very weak part of the sector, but we believe um, absolutely critical for these notions of multi-generational learning, given that we have such a high proportion of adults who have not completed, uh, for example, secondary schooling. Um, and uh, we, we follow this up with what we hope to be useful information, which is for countries to what are the actual strategies to make it um, to progress on each of these indicators. And so there is a larger set of recommendations that are somewhat nested within the indicators that are meant to be strategies uh, for policymakers, but also for communities um, to be able to engage in to advance um, uh, lifelong and multi-generational learning for sustainable development. So thank you very much, and any suggestions? I think we're all asking for suggestions to the same email address, so just specify the report you read. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much. We're coming, last but not least, to um, the report on agriculture, um, which will be presented by Achim Dobermann, who is the Deputy Director General of the International Rice Research Institute in the Philippines, working at the forefront of making agriculture sustainable and more productive. Um, we will have questions, uh, time for questions afterwards. So if you have, if you'd like to ask questions, may I, ask, may I kindly ask you to sort of start make your way to the microphone in the middle of the of the corridor. And we've got one challenge for the coaches. We need to find space for one more chair. Um, we'll work this out. Great. Achim. Yeah, agri agriculture has been put last because uh, in the course of the last eight months, uh, we have discovered that it should be actually be at the center of the new sustainable development agenda. So I'm very pleased to have the last word here today. Uh, we are 16 members of, uh, in our group, and uh, we've produced our final report, uh, which is out there. And it has also been up for public consultation input by about another 30 different organizations, businesses, institutions. So the first point I want to make is that in this process that all of us who, who have participated have probably learned a lot about the diversity and complexity of the agricultural and food system in the world. And the, the pictures in front of this uh, are just a few that show the different aspects involved. We could have had hundreds of those, and I think every consumer also recognizes the many multiple dimensions uh, that one way or another, agriculture uh, directly or indirectly uh, contributes to our daily life. So the first point that we would like to make is so that uh, uh, it has therefore many contributions to whatever the new set of sustainable development goals and their targets will be. In the report, in chapter three, uh, we go at length uh, into a discussion of those uh, targets for agriculture, the indicators, and also something that we call aspirational outcomes uh, for each indicator, a quantitative statement basically saying, okay, what you should aim for, you know, it's not just enough to say what the indicator is, we also need to know what's good and what's bad, and what is something that we can be happy with. So we support strongly the notion that uh, there needs to be an explicit goal on poverty and hunger. So that's uh, goal number one that has been proposed by the SDSN as a whole. 
because uh, we have the unique opportunity in our generation to probably uh, eradicate at least the extreme forms of hunger and poverty in the next 15 years. And uh, of course it has uh, various aspects when it comes to hunger, uh, the different forms of malnutrition. Uh, but we do believe that a strong emphasis uh, uh, needs to be placed on this uh, and therefore also agriculture in particular, broad-based agricultural growth uh, being one of the most effective means to uh, contribute to this. We also support the notion that uh, in addition to this there needs to be an explicit goal that focuses on improving agricultural systems uh, and rural development in an integrative manner. Those go hand in hand, uh, not just because uh, on one side we want to ag make agriculture more productive and more efficient and more environmentally friendly, uh, but also we need to transform rural areas uh, into more decent places to live for people. And that involves the aspect of structural transformations that actually will mean new business models for smallholder farmers, but probably also for many of them actually as a best development path to get out of farming. Yeah. And it also means uh, that therefore we need to find ways to create new job opportunities uh, in the whole value chain, in the agricultural, non-agricultural sector, also in rural areas, unless uh, we accept that everybody should move to the cities and therefore create more problems for uh, Cynthia and her group and others. Yeah. So therefore a goal on integrated improvement of agricultural systems and rural development is in our uh, view important and we elaborate at length uh, on the targets and the indicators uh, for this. In addition to this, uh, we discussed the contributions that uh, agriculture and food systems make to a number of other goals, particularly health, uh, uh, climate, uh, or decarbonizing energy systems, uh, ecosystem services, and even good governance. We then uh, go uh, quite a bit into a discussion of what are the potential pathways for making agriculture more sustainable. How can we do this transformation? Uh, we realize that uh, just increasing the productivity or on the supply side isn't going to be good enough. That has been the model of the past. You know, we have been following this for the last 50 years and agriculture has been hugely successful in a way because total output on a global basis has risen on an average pretty much between 2.1 and 2.5 percent each year for the last 50 years. But it has consumed resources and so the next uh, phase definitely has to focus on uh, productivity and efficiency growth yeah, in the context of preserving uh, critical natural resources uh, that um, to some extent are also non-renewable. Yeah. So how do we achieve this? Of course, uh, uh, requires interventions uh, on the production side and I think there the fundamental principle to follow is that efficiency growth needs to be faster than the actual yield grows needed, if you wish, yeah? so that we finally decouple uh, agricultural output growth uh, from the growth and input use. Yeah? It will not be possible to suddenly switch back or even to go extre to extreme forms uh, that have been sometimes proposed, like low input or organic agriculture, because we cannot feed the world with this. Yeah. They all play a role in certain markets and certain environments. But we have to, in general, go towards the efficiency growth path, and the rate of that growth needs to be faster than the total output growth. We also believe that there are transformations needed on the demand side, so that particularly uh, relates to the consumer side and shifting diets, but also reducing losses and wastes. The realistic potential for this and how fast this can be achieved is still largely unknown, yeah. uh, but they need to be part of the solutions. Uh, we discuss uh, as examples uh, 16 uh, solutions or for early action, and these are just examples. Yeah. We also discuss uh, uh, quite at length uh, long-term interventions and the urgent need to also make stronger commitments in R&D, which we believe needs to double agricultural R&D. It is at the moment only 5% of uh, global uh, R&D as a whole, uh, and it has uh, been very uneven. Uh, when you look at developing countries, 
more than 50% of the R&D expenditures in developing countries are just coming, or transition countries, are just in three countries, Brazil, China, and India. And so all the rest is falling way behind. We have a chapter on implementation. And there, the principles that we state is that countries need to lead the implementation and define their transformative pathways on their own uh, with the right uh, support and following the principles for a sustainable agricultural intensification that we uh, propose. Yeah. But in the end, uh, they need to define their targets. Uh, they are very different targets by countries. The starting points are very different. The workable options and solutions uh, will be quite different and uh, diverse because of the different contexts. Yeah. But we believe that uh, by and large, uh, it is possible if uh, there is enough political will and the policies that currently often put constraints on things or distort things or changed effectively, it should be possible to achieve the multiple goals of uh, agriculture in the next generation. Yeah. So basically eradicate poverty and hunger make sure that we have a stable and safe uh, food supply and that we do it within ecologically acceptable boundaries and on top of that achieve a transformation of rural environments so that people uh, will stay there or at least have a better living there uh, rather than uh, having to stay in poverty or leaving the country. So we now obviously have completed the work on this report. We will continue to support the work of the Open Working Group in this process as needed, and we will shift our attention to hopefully promoting some of the solutions uh, proposed. Thanks. Thank you very much, Achim. We, um, so we've heard across, across the range of, um, a broad range of issues that the, the challenges are deep but that solutions actually exist. Um, these are not often off-the-shelf solutions that can simply be plucked and implemented. There's a huge amount of problem solving that needs to happen. We know broadly how to address these challenges, but there are lots of nooks and crannies that need to be worked out, and that's what we're trying to, that's what we're trying to promote over the next few years. Now the floor is open to you to, um, to ask questions. Could I please ask you, in the interest of time, to be brief? Just please introduce yourself briefly. <laughs> And um, please feel free to identify the, the, um, the panelists or the panelists to whom your, your question is addressed. And we'll take a few questions and then um, uh, turn to answers. Thank you. Yes, can you hear me? Yeah, I'm Ed Berry with the Sustainable World Initiative. And uh, first of all, what we've heard is a, a fabulous amount of wonderful work that's going on in the world. Thanks you for all your efforts. Uh, I'd like to go back to the first speaker, though, Shaheem, and, and just mention our, our worldview is that the scale of the human endeavor has grown so large that we're simply overwhelming the planet now. And I think your pictures of a burning earth kind of substantiate that. And, and if indeed that's true, that we're out of balance with the planet's systems, then we really have two choices. We, we can focus on those systems and the the, demand, the supply side, if you will, or we can think more about the demand side and whether or not our societies are doing the right things to fit within nature rather than always adapting nature to fit our needs. And I'm wondering if you'd, you'd comment on that. We really think it's important that, that we start to measure and assess the biophysical sustainability of societies to see whether or not we're, we're in balance and whether we can take actions which bring us back into balance, if you will. Thank you. If you please go to, if you have a question, please, or if you'd like to ask a question, if you could just line up behind the microphone, that would be ideal. Thank you. My name is Daniel Weiner. I'm from uh, Switzerland. I'm the chairman of Global Infrastructure Basel, which works on finance for sustainable infrastructure. My question is a very general one. Um, when we hear the panelists, uh, I have the impression that there's a lot of value judgment also behind some of the um, work, and that's very natural, it's, it's normal. And when you go back to the UN, there's a lot of differences about values. And it's very difficult to position oneself as a scientific panel vis-a-vis -vis an organization that has a lot of struggling, it struggle, uh, struggles a lot with values. For instance, as an example, just 
it occurred to me that the presentation on education totally ignored the fact that a lot of the education is taking place in the context of religions, in churches, mosques, and monasteries, for instance. It was just the secular part of education that we were, you were looking at. And probably avoid the other part because um, it is very controversial to look at it in a scientific way. But that's what then comes out is a, a picture of the reality that doesn't, um, is a little bit a mismatch of what we have in the world. It's just an example, it's not a criticism. I just want to, to, to give an, a, an example that's very telling. So maybe it's a, a question to the leadership of this uh, network to answer how do you, when this knowledge comes into the real world, it becomes, uh, there's going to be a lot of political and value-based discussion. How do you deal with that? Um, I'm Heather Barclay from the International Planned Parenthood Federation and equally I'd like to thank you all for taking the time to share the outcomes of your, your reports with us. Um, quite a few of the panelists mentioned um, population growth and population dynamics and shifts in demography um, as issues in, in the sustainable um, development framework and my question is just if any of you see a role for access to voluntary family planning or uh, sexual and reproductive health and rights coming out in any of your reports or recommendations, if you have any views on that. Thank you very much. Hi, um, my name is Maru Hussain and I'm a development practice student here at Columbia University. Uh, my question is regarding um, the urban development goal and um, if any focus will be given on violence in cities and crime prevention and if um, if there would be any focus on what, what crime and violence um, and how that develops development in cities. Thank you. Hello, my name is Angel Adilaja. I'm representing the Senior Special Assistant to the President of Nigeria on Poverty Reduction. And um, one of the things that we um, really f are starting to look at is really getting these, um, this research and uh, helping us uh, pr provide policies that lead to in, um, innovative um, in, uh, interventions that help uh, our societies from, from the grassroots perspective. And one thing that's really missing is that link between research and really um, the implementation of some of these, because for us, uh, some of this is done mainly by government. So we wanna know what are the ways in which we're able to link this research that's being done and some of the ideas that are put forward to help policymakers actually make that radical change and start to actually affect um, innovation, innovative um, interventions for pro-poor you know, policies. So thank Great. you. Great, thank you. Let's take two more questions and then we'll have a round of answers and then we'll have another round of questions if there are more. Hi, my name is Hanna Wetterstrand. I'm working at the Stockholm Resilience Center as an advisor to Johan Rockström, who is coming tomorrow. Uh, my question relates to like uh, the holistic perspective and how you uh, plan to work together in between the thematic groups like for instance the interlinkages between the urban and rural sector is really really what is crucial and so a little bit uninvestigated um, and my other question relates to how you plan to actually engage politicians of course i agree that the changes will happen among people but to a large extent come yeah, also coming from sweden we have a lot of experience in the importance of having strong regulations as a basis for the innovations that will trigger a more sustainable society. Okay, thanks. Right. Hello, I'm Olivier Vermeulen. I'm from Belgium. I'm the representative for sustainable development in our youth council. And so I first want to thank because I've heard a lot about equity in some uh, presentations and I think it's maybe one thing that is in all of the presentation, it has to be present everywhere. And the second thing I, I want to tell and ask you how to implement it is about, uh, like the first speaker here, uh, the first commentator, he said, it's about the limits actually, and like uh, Paul Collier said, the limits of everything we have about resources and energy. And limits also brings limits of efficiency and limits of yields and all that kind of limits of productions. And so we, we need uh, at a time to, to see that what, what we produce has to uh, be, be set in some limits. And uh, I don't know how that humility, actually, that the, the, the thing that people uh, 
have to understand that we cannot do everything we want and, and be more efficient and more productive, that's not possible anymore. And I, I want to see how we could bring that in, like the, the person before said, like in a holistic view of every uh, biophysical function of our Earth, how that, that could be put in, together in all your reports. And especially about agriculture, uh, because I'm working with a professor at my university that works a lot about um, agroecology. Um, it, there is a problem we cannot put efficiency and more yield as the, the answer to our uh, food problems. Uh, the, the answers will, would be in the populations. That's what some of our speakers said, and it's really good. And to change our manner of uh, produ producing and to be humble because we cannot be more efficient uh, without using more energy, without using fossil fuels that will degrade our climates. And so I want to see a holistic uh, answer of all of it uh, in the humility of humankind. Thanks. Great. Thank you. Great question. So um, let's try and group them a little bit. They were, um, the first and last questions were about resource efficiency um, and um, particularly also linked to agriculture and the, the oval limits. I was wondering if maybe Shahid and, and Achim, if you wanted to, to address this issue and if you, to the extent you want to also speak to the broader question of, of how to live within, within, within the environmental limits that clearly exist. And I, maybe just for the record, I need to add that the groups that have presented here represent the vast majority of the work that's going on, but not all the work that's happening within the, uh, within the SCSN. We're doing a lot of work on climate change. We're gearing up for major initiatives there. Um, that work is not quite ready yet to be, to be presented. We're also working on the special needs of fragile states. Um, we have another group that's working on businesses, the role of the private sector. They met yesterday. They're not producing another report, um, but looking at, at actionable um, opportunities um, to involve business and to address challenges of short-termism um, and the discrepancy between public objectives and private incentives. Um, and finally, we also have a group that's looking at the, at the big picture um, of um, uh, economic development within planetary boundaries. That, so um, we don't have all the expertise here around the table to answer every single question in full detail, but I think we have a lot. So Shahid and Achim, please. Well, thanks for uh, uh, trying to summarize a very diverse array of, uh, of questions, but I think you touched on lots of things that um, you wouldn't be surprised that I think many of us have already been thinking about and been deliberating over for quite some time. Um, and I think that's one of the good things about having these groups together. For um, the specific question about um, supply and demand, or addressing the supply uh, versus addressing the demand all the time, um, and uh, uh, balances between those two, I think um, it actually ties to this question about limits, which comes up a few times. And we don't actually, uh, I try to avoid the word limits um, and stick to the word boundaries, because boundary is something that can be moved. And um, uh, right now, we imagine what these boundaries are, but we imagine that if there was a change in technology, a change in culture, a change in um, uh, uh, economics, those boundaries could shift um, and, and, and things might um, be quite different. But it's important to know where the boundaries are. <laughs> so until, you know, because uh, otherwise you don't want to cross them, but you do want to know whether you need to move them, how fast you're approaching them and so forth. So um, I feel as a researcher that we're not really quite sure um, how rigid those boundaries are. So for the natural world, I guess the biggest uh, change that's occurring is agriculture. So it leads naturally uh, to, to that topic. Um, and, and, and that's um, uh, from an ecological perspective. They're ecosystems as well. Um, it's just that they've shifted the ecosystem services um, um, that uh, we need to provide other sort of functionalities that keep us from crossing those boundaries. And um, in the same way that farms have been very good at increasing uh, 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 provisioning services, I wonder if we could actually have something like a farming system that was involved with, um, and where people were paid for providing regulating services, where people were paid for climate regulation, where people were paid for the other services, the way farmers are paid for provisioning, provisioning services. And I actually think we could do that. In fact, I wonder if we could actually pay farmers who provide provisioning services to also provide climate regulation. And I guess the systems of carbon taxes and other sorts of things are, are aiming to do that. Could we pay them um, to provide cultural services as well as repositories of, of biodiversity that matter to people culturally and recreationally and so forth? 
Um, uh, and we know where the boundaries are. It's just a question of how fast we're going to approach them and can we move them. Yeah, maybe expanding a little bit on this. Um, I think the, the issue of uh, trade-offs uh, is of particular importance when it comes uh, to the whole agriculture and food system, obviously because on one side we know we need to produce more and we can't change consumption patterns as quickly as we would like it to. But on the other side, we have the uh, limited resource base. So it is very clear uh, that there are going to be trade-offs and hard choices to be made. Uh, and I think every country will have to make those choices. Uh, we cannot uh, turn a switch and all of a sudden hope that we have a green agriculture tomorrow. Yeah. But I think there is also still a lot of work to be done to define uh, what those uh, limits uh, actually should be. So when we take as one example the planetary boundaries that have been proposed and uh, the ones that are affecting agriculture as a most probably are uh, related to the biochemical cycles, so uh, the reactive nitrogen and phosphorus load. And if we would uh, say that the boundary as it has been proposed uh, is to cut back on the reactive nitrogen creation to 25% of at current levels. If we would do this, obviously, uh, the majority of the world uh, would go back into starvation. Yeah. So we can't do this. This is clear. Yeah. So what we have to do is uh, move uh, towards a system uh, in which we can achieve higher levels of efficiency along the whole food chain. Yeah. So when you look at nitrogen again in this case, uh, and you apply a full chain concept that involves uh, uh, interventions from the combustion stage, so the production of reactive nitrogen in the industrial cycle, to the use in the field, to what we feed or what we grow as animals, what we do as consumers, and how much of that we recycle. Yeah. So you have many stages along that chain where we at present in many countries do not have the efficiencies that we should be having. But at the same time, we have many other countries like in Sub-Saharan Africa where the primary intervention is to actually apply more nitrogen you know, to get the productivity up. You know. So we will have to have these different pathways. Uh, there will be trade-offs. You cannot achieve all of these things at once everywhere. That is clear. I'd like to also comment uh, maybe on the first uh, comment on values, yeah, because uh, uh, in, again in the agricultural sector we have a lot of emotional debates going on you know, uh, that are usually uh, you know, a mixing or controversial discussion of values versus science. You know. So people talk about organic food or particularly people when they discuss uh, the pros and cons of genetically modified organisms or GM crops and food. Yeah. And in some of these discussions, uh, I'm also involved in, uh, sometimes I have the impression that uh, the more scientific evidence we provide, the worse uh, uh, we make the discussion, huh? because we cannot, through scientific evidence, uh, change value propositions for many people, which are very different. Yeah and also for policy makers. Yeah. So that's going to be an interesting challenge uh, also for the scientific community to actually come out of their shell. You know, we have so often uh, had a position where we say, okay, we are the ones who know the truth. You know? But you know, we, we know some piece of the truth, yeah? uh, but we also have different values. Yeah? So we need to engage actually more actively uh, with different groups who have different value propositions for those things. Yeah? And then it is uh, for the society as a whole to basically weigh uh, the different values and the scientific evidence uh, to make the right decisions. Yeah. I find these controversial discussions very unproductive. They're not helping us to move forward. Yeah. But unfortunately, at least in the agricultural sector, uh, that seems to be often what's also dominating the news. Yeah. Let's maybe stick to the, to the theme of values that was, came up in several questions. Um, Joshua, how maybe if you could just see how your group, on the, the human rights group, is, 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 is tackling this question of value, and um, and then there was a, a specific question on on, on sexual reproductive yeah. 
health rights, and I would of course like um, Srinath also to speak to that. And then hero education was, um, was used as one example um, of the differences in values, differences in systems. I was wondering if maybe you and Srinath could also speak briefly to this question of integration. You mentioned it um, uh, with the example of early childhood development, how it really feeds into education, or it belongs to education and health and broader range. How do you see this work out operationally? How, how can those linkages that we're all aware of be made operational? Um, right, if I may start on the question of values, Daniel, thank you for that. I mean, it's, it's a fundamental question that we had to ask ourselves within our group. And in, in many ways, my answer is probably exactly the same as Achim, but with a very different reasoning to it. And in, in the, the essence of which is that human rights itself has been extremely problematic, has been described as a neo-colonial tool, Western-oriented, all of these aspects. Yet the kind of human rights and gender inclusion that we are trying to look at is across the board and has, is, is laced with different value systems. So values is, for us is not in the periphery, it's in the center. And, and I think when you look at this question, when you look at sustainable development from the perspective of what we are trying to achieve, for me it transcends values, that the, the goal itself is a value. And the goal itself is a value that needs to be really grasped and then the only way we can give it any substance is, as Akim says, to keep listening and keep, op keep being open to it. And that, that is our approach. So we, we've been talking about human rights in a Chinese context as much as in an in a, you know, American context, as much as in a European context. We've had indigenous people's views on, on human rights, which sometimes inherently contradict the, the views that we might have in another more formalized legal setting. So we've had to, t I don't think it's fair to say that in our group, We've tried to avoid those issues. Certainly religion is, uh, plays an important role in the setting and the calibrating of how society operates. So we can't really ignore that in any shape or form and still hope to come at, uh, arrive at any, any social inclusion goal. But with social inclusion as being the fundamental goal, then we have to simply take account of all the, the contours, all the landscapes that exist, and focus on the fact that social inclusion is what underlies it. And that's not contradictory. So I think that's our tackle, that's the way we've tackled it. And that's also uh, uh, gives me an opening to answer the question on sexual reproductive rights, where we've had lots of discussion, lots of debates, and lots of, re, um, lots of disagreements even within it. But it is very much in our report. We've taken that particular perspective on it. And really, you can't look at women's rights and, and any kind of gender-oriented aspect without focusing on that. And so despite the fact that it would be a lot easier not to focus on it, we've decided that we have to focus on it because it's a fundamental um, obstacle to achieving the kind of inclusion we're talking about. So uh, the person who asked us which report is it in, it's actually in this particular report and I, I can read you bits of it but I'd suggest that maybe it's easier for you to read it as well and, and engage in that conversation. But we welcome any other views you might have on that particular issue. Thank you. Um, uh, thank you for the comment on values. Uh, so um, uh, well, one example that is in our report, uh, which I think is a beautiful example of the integration of culture, values, and education precisely around the issue of religiously, uh, uh, religion, um, is, a, is a wonderful example of a preschool curriculum that was developed in East Africa called the Madrasa Preschool Program, uh, which integrated um, uh, really scientific evidence on what, is, uh, what builds skills across domains in early childhood development with um, a religiously informed curriculum, then integrated with science in that it was evaluated with a culturally, um, a locally developed uh, measure called the African Child um, Development Scale, as well as Western scales of cognitive skills. So that's, um, I think, we put that in there precisely to illustrate the integration of issues of values of science and of practice in uh, in educational instruction. I th it looks like sexual and reproductive health and family planning are in multiple reports then. It is certainly in our report under the, uh, this kind of multi-generational link, the cross generations, which I think bringing in the early childhood development focus um, did bring into our report. Um, uh, we have some focus on violence prevention as a developmental perspective um, is what uh, uh, really uh, brought the, our group together around education as lifelong learning and so we do have to think about the links between violence prevention uh, at different stages of children's development and what that means ultimately for peace building and for conflict uh, situations. 
Uh, finally, in the role of um, science to policy, uh, we do also have a section on the role of universities. Um, and I think Jeff talked about the network that the SDSN will be building um, of uh, universities around the world. And we think there is a lot of promise in sharing solutions and mutual capacity building um, where I have to say the Global North has as much um, to learn from the Global South um, as far as uh, uh, research um, and the relationship of science to policy and practice. Uh, as far as uh, sexual and reproductive health rights are concerned, clearly the provision of services, availability of and affordability of these services is part of our recommendation for universal health coverage. Uh, it's been incorporated in the goal as well as in the first target explicitly referring to sexual and reproductive health. The question of translating it into a right where there is autonomy and independence of choice is the next step. And there we have very clearly said health itself is a right and we have taken a rights-based approach to health. And therefore, within that context of health overall, uh, the right to exercise choice in terms of sexual and reproductive health with fully assured availability of services is the construct that we are recommending in our report. Now, as far as the integration is concerned, obviously, uh, the example uh, that uh, Guido wanted us to take up was education and health. Clearly, there is a great connection. A sick child is unlikely to go to school or gain adequately from education and the cognitive development is going to be impaired. At the same time, a child who is also educated about some of the issues related to health and nutrition can actually utilize that education as they move along further in life and protect their own health. And therefore, education is a very key in, uh, ingredient in terms of enhancing an individual's ability to protect and promote one's own health. But also the integration actually starts from early childhood, right from conception to early childhood, and then later on into adolescence. Even when we look at maternal health, for example, which was one of the MDGs, we cannot only look at maternal health as a period between conception and end of pregnancy. We have to look at it from the time there's an underfed girl child moving on to an adolescent, anemic adolescent, going in for an early marriage, and then having, again, a very small born child or a stillbirth. Therefore, this intergenerational continuum of inequity has to be replaced by an intergenerational integration of adequate nutrition, gender equity, and health. And all that brings in the whole intergenerational component as well as the integrative element of sustainable development. Great. Um, several, several questions focused on implementation. It's all very well to write reports and to, um, and to um, announce what should happen, but the, the proof is in the pudding. So how do these things get implemented? And perhaps Pedro and, um, and Cynthia and Aroma are sort of looking at two sets of particularly complex issues, the, the governance of natural resources in Africa and elsewhere, but then also the urban governance. How, how do you see this, this, this moving forward? What is it that you're doing, you're thinking of what's the network doing, how can other people perhaps get engaged to, to really improve the transmission mechanisms from, from, from great ideas to action? And perhaps, Cynthia Arama, if you can also address the specific question on urban violence. Yeah, yeah I guess we'll pick up from there. Um, I, I think maybe before the violence question, the question of values. And I think one of the things that sort of helps integrate a lot of the work we're talking about is the fact, at least as, as we see it, is that the goals are deeply value-laden but not necessarily biased, and I'll explain that. So if you, if you look at the urban goal, the urban goal starts with one word, which is empower, then it goes on to empower, inclusive, productive, and resilient cities. So I take the first word. The first word, empowerment, is a deeply value-laden term. It implies that there are some people who are disempowered and who need to be enfranchised. So that's, you know, just, just the opening question of how you build agency. And when we sort of link that into questions of, of violence, Again, if I read from the goal, we're saying makes all cities socially inclusive. That's the connection to the rights-based approach dealing with human development. It goes on to say make them socially inclusive, economically productive, environmentally sustainable, and secure. Because we recognize that if security, security is an outcome, but what sits behind that 
is the fact that they are high, you know, that the whole range of different systems of social exclusion, from gender to ethnicity, etc., which underpin that. And if you don't address those questions, the outcome very often is violence, whether it's in the household or it goes out into the streets and, you know, it expresses itself. So, you know, obviously the question of, of violence is central to the way we look at, look at, look at the city, to make the city uh, secure for, you know, all ages and all, all, all sets of people is critical. Um, the next question I think that's sort of fairly important to look at, and it ties into the question of implementation, is what we, we see as a somewhat artificial divide between the rural and the urban. Cities cannot survive without ecosystem services and food. Wherever they've tried to, you know, civilizations have fallen. Between Cynthia and myself, I guess we have more than 50 years of collective experience on agriculture and rural development. So, I mean, we speak both from our personal experiences to those questions. So, the integration is crucial. It is a continuum, but a continuum in which the center of gravity is moving towards an urban culture. So, this transition, whether it's in human development terms or infrastructure terms, is something that we have to come to understand and deal with. And that centrally sort of depends on being able to provide better quality of life, the end of, uh, of, of rural poverty, and access to all the critical inputs we need for development in rural areas. So that linkage is absolutely critical. And without that, in some senses, sustainability is not possible. And to be very, very concrete about that, it is not necessary for all countries in the world, whatever, 190 of them, to go into a situation where the bulk of the population is in urban areas. It is possible, at the high end you look at Switzerland, at the lower end you look at the countries of South Asia, uh, to have relatively large proportions of the population who live in villages, uh, who are very well served, in which a quality of life is possible. So there's no one sort of system of, of employment or economic structure that the entire world has to uh, reach out to. So to the question of implementation. Yes, I want to give a concrete example. Aro and I just came over from a workshop at another Columbia building, Earth Institute uh, um, workshop, that br is bringing together uh, urban climate change researchers from cities around the world and deci city decision makers around working together on concrete solutions for both mitigation and adaptation. It's this kind of, this is to answer the question about how do we create those links between the research and, the, and governments and to actually go to implementation. And it's this kind of new forms of interaction, very exciting, it's just, a, it's a really a very exciting workshop in which people are rolling up their sleeves and actually finding the solutions, it ve very much co-generated between the decision makers and the researchers. Just to add to that, I think what we're trying to experiment with, and I, I guess many of the other thematic groups are already into the process, but certainly from the urban side, is to look at whether the global frameworks are operationalizable at local level. So from the STSN Sustainable Cities Group, we've actually kicked off a process that started in Rio a couple of months ago, and will roll out in a number of cities across each, each geography, so one large city across each geography, to test whether the frameworks that we're talking about here and bringing together using you know, some of the best decision makers and, and researchers and, and policy makers in, in, in the world can actually work. Do we have the evidence to do that? That's why, for example, in, in a very practical sense, our group has goals and targets. We have some sense of what the indicators are like. We're not as well endowed as health and, and education, which have very specific indicators. And the reason is very simple. What we've learned from practice is that cities are so diverse across the world that you cannot necessarily have a complete orthogonal set of indicators that are universal. There may be some that are universal, but some of them need actually to be developed and tested at local level. So the frame of governance is moving both top down and bottom up. And like I said, we don't necessarily have the answers, but we're starting to explore them. And maybe in a year and a half's time or two years' time, we'll have some evidence from maybe, you know, half a dozen cities across the world of how this may work in practice. Um, thank you. I'll, I'll, I'll be stepping in now to complete uh, the story that uh, Paul Collier started. I think in our particular case, um, as you would agree with me, uh, it's, it, was, it was very challenging to, to deal with a sector which uh, handles no renewable resources and to start talking uh, on, about sustainability. So our starting point, of course, 
was about uh, ensuring that the narrative would be one that would ensure that uh, the non-renewable asset would be used with a view to creating lasting forms of capital that can outlast the currency of extractive industry. So uh, on that basis, therefore, being holistic in the way we, 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 we look at our solutions was key. For example, if you go uh, into uh, uh, the report, you'll see that uh, we, uh, uh, I, for in developing countries, we've noted that uh, mineral resources provided the rents to support infrastructure development. Then, so the key issue uh, in our uh, chapter on uh, resources and infrastructure development was to ensure that that infrastructure base which was created to support the mining industry would be also a vehicle to open up opportunities in other sectors of the economy, particularly agriculture, tourism, and so on, which do not have the same levels of rents that, that the extractive industry uh, produce. So that is one uh, aspect of the, the narrative on the extractive sector, to, to look at uh, uh, how to utilize the mineral wealth to, fo to create other forms of capital, fiscal, social, uh, uh, human capital, that could provide the foundations for real sustained development. So that is a key principle. Then also because this year in particular was very, a very busy year. We had the, the uh, Kofi Annan report, uh, the African Progress Panel report. We had the OECD report on, on extractives. We had a report of my own organization, which uh, the United Nations Economic Commission for Africa, which was also on extractives. So we, we, we decided therefore not to try and reinvent the wheel, instead to focus on practical solutions. And I think this answers the question from the lady from Nigeria. Uh, to which extent, uh, uh, in our uh, report, we're trying to address the real needs of policymakers. For example, we've introduced uh, uh, an instrument uh, called the Country Mining Visions, which is essentially trying to uh, broaden ownership uh, within given jur jurisdiction on how the mineral resources sector is governed, how the, the uh, revenues are, are, are distributed, are managed, and so on. And the starting point uh, uh, for that process is what we call the country mining vision, which will start by asking through uh, multi-stakeholders uh, platforms, what are the different assumptions of, of value that the, the stakeholders have. Uh, there are all sorts of instruments out there. For example, the World Economic Forum has developed the Minerals Value Management Framework uh, that has identified seven dimensions of value. One which is optimizing revenue streams, so royalty, taxes, and so on. Others will be looking at uh, 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 maximizing opportunities for job creation, which are limited in a capital intensive industry like the extractives. Uh, local communities are, are preoccupied with ensuring that their social fabric is not disrupted because of the in, uh, extractive industry. They would like the environment not to be impacted. And of course, linkages and diversification is, is a very key component of this. So uh, the, the country mining vision process allows for those uh, uh, issues to be, to be uh, discussed and that the different stakeholders align their, their, their perceptions about it with a view to having a common vision that can outlast the, the, the uh, political cycles and so on and so forth. So that is a practical instrument that uh, is out in the report to support policy, policy uh, formulation. Um, uh, on the issue of, um, of, of resources for infrastructure, for example, the, the, the report uh, articulates all sorts of options uh, to, you know, with a view to uh, uh, optimizing, uh, uh, as I said earlier, uh, uh, resources which were uh, uh, designed to support the mining industry to promote in development. We have this concept of resource corridors, uh, and then uh, there are a couple of um, uh, suggestions out there. Um, then we are trying to look at what is, uh, what are different actors doing and then trying to suggest how to scale those initiatives uh, with a view to uh, making them uh, 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 available to larger uh, uh, constituencies. So uh, there is an effort to try uh, and identify 
uh, uh, what uh, initiatives could be, uh, could, that have replicability, it could be uh, therefore uh, made into toolkits and guidelines that could support policy implementation uh, across different jurisdictions. So uh, essentially, the report is, is trying to be as practical as possible and then anchored on, on existing processes and facilitating coordination with a view to ensuring uh, that we have scale and impact. So that is the philosophy and the principles that have informed uh, this report. Thank you. Great. Thank you much. A huge thank you to, um, to the authors of this report. We don't have time for more questions. We've already gone well over our time. So thank you very much. Let me just, in closing, just underscore that many of the reports presented here today, some have already gone through public consultations, others are starting their public consultation today. They're up on our website. We'll also circulate them through all the various networks, thematic networks, and this is the beginning of a conversation. So these comments, the questions were very helpful, but we're looking forward to comments, suggestions, critiques, what's missing, what doesn't seem quite right to get, um, to, get to, to further improve these reports. The final versions of these reports will of course be made publicly available and will also feed into the various post-2015 processes and will be um, submitted to the Secretary General. Um, you've all heard that the focus here really is, um, is on solutions and so we all see these reports as the beginning of the work and, um, and uh, actually launching and undertaking a number of, um, of ambitious initiatives on the ground to, to, to establish proof of concept and to support the scaling up of this, um, of this work and would love to work with, with whoever is interested in, in being part of this. If you want to reach out to us, take a look at our website, sign up to our newsletter um, and be in touch. Thanks for joining us for what hopefully was a very interesting and stimulating discussion.